this week on The Travel Show. Mastering the tile with a style in Morocco. You are doing a great job. You are doing a great job. Yeah. Right. Well, I tried. <laughs> OK, down the hatch. Nick tries out a thousand-year-old delicacy in Turkey. And we're talking tortoise on the coast of Senegal. Why is he called Phil? Can I ask? Because he arrived the month where Bill Clinton was elected. So you are named after a president. Welcome to Morocco and the historic city that's sometimes known as the country's cultural capital, Fez. From its medinas and mosques to its madrasas, Fez is steeped in cultural heritage. So much so that the medina of Fez is listed as a World Heritage Site. Mind-blowing, absolutely incredible. This is the Atarine Madrasa. It goes back to the 14th century, and it is perhaps the best example of what they call zelish. Zelish is a style of mosaic tile work made from individually hand chisel pieces that is found all across Morocco, as well as parts of Tunisia, Algeria, and southern Spain. The detail, tiny, tiny detail. The art form dates back over a thousand years, but the more intricate and colourful designs which have become synonymous with Moroccan architecture were developed in the 14th century. الحوار مع الإنسان لما تنظر إليه عندما تنظر أنت إلى هذا الزليج ربما أنت تهتم بهذا اللون الأصفر ربما أنا أهتم بهذا اللون الأزرق وبالتالي هذا الزليج يعطي عدة قراءات حسب الناظر الذي ينظر إليه فهو من يعني من من الأشياء الفنية الفريدة من نوعها Despite its mixed origins and geographical spread, experts like Faoud believe that زليج is a vital part of his country's history and culture. حقيقة الزليج في ارتباطه بالهوية المغربية يمكن أن نقول أن المغاربة كلهم بدون بدون تمييز عرفوا الزليج إما في منازلهم ولا سيما جيل ستين أو السبعينات هادو يعني ولدوا في بيوت قديمة تراثية. Authorities here have long wanted to formalize Zelish's Moroccan connection. It's not uncommon for countries to do this by gaining UN-recognized intangible cultural heritage status. For example, the French recently achieved this with a humble baguette, as have Jamaica with reggae music. But in the case of Zelish, Morocco went a stage further and insisted on having it patented. It's part of a drive to protect the country's assets from cultural appropriation and commercialization. We call it the positive protection, and that is just to protect their traditional knowledge, or in this case, cultural expression, uh, from other people's using it in a different way and exploiting them. It's not black and white. There is a lot of nuances. The use of traditional cultural expressions or knowledge what is black and white is the threat to its future. The skilled craft is facing competition from cheaper mass production and fewer people interested in taking up the practice. I travelled to a traditional workshop just outside the Medina to find out just what goes into this ancient process. How many of these do you think he does every... Every day? Yeah. So every day he depends. If, for example, he can make up to 1,000 pieces a day. Has he ever 
banged his fingers. I'm going to grab something. Take me to the concert. Grab something. I'm going to grab something. Tell me. No, no, never, never. Saeed's craft skills were learned as a boy, and some Zelish producers are worried that these techniques will not be passed down to future generations. And that's partly because pay and working conditions are not as attractive as in other industries. Saeed earns around 12 euros a day. So as you're seeing, he's doing this by hand as well. Yeah, look at Nothing that. Nothing else. Wow. Yes. And again, this is, this is exactly the same way this is exactly they did it for hundreds of years. Apprenticeships can take up to a decade, and for most people, it's a lifelong dedication. So we do have our artisans who work as a couple, okay? The first one who is the one responsible of cutting the tile, as you're seeing here, mm -hmm. with this specific type of pencil. Okay? okay. You just take this shape of it, the design of it, yeah. and start cutting it one by one, piece by piece, with a, with a sharp hammer. I don't know who I think I am, but I'm going to have a go at trying to create a shape from this. And apparently, you have to sit down exactly the way that this guy was sitting down before. So here we go. Okay. <laughs> it can take six months just to achieve the correct sitting position. Let alone try to cut and shape the tiles. Job. Am I doing a great job? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Well, I tried. <laughs> so after assembling all the pieces, mm -hmm. we bring them all the way to another artisan who is responsible of putting the pieces next to each other. Every single piece, it's like a type of puzzle. So, what does Otmain think about Morocco's successful claim of ownership of Zelish? Morocco is very well known when it comes to its culture and traditions. And the heritage, the culture of the heritage that we have, is typically Moroccan. And those artisans that we're talking about are typically Moroccan as well. As for the future, it's hoped that the craft, with its new protected status, will survive, thrive, and proudly proclaim made in Morocco. Lisa, I am a artist هو هي منشأة لمجتمع Now, if you're thinking of taking a trip to Morocco in 2023, here are some travel show tips as to things you might want to see and do. Now, did you know that Morocco is the very first country on the African continent to build a high-speed railway? Whipping along at 320 kilometers per hour, the Al Burak service will take you from Tangier in the north to the capital, Rabat, and down to Casablanca in around two hours. That's less than half the time of the older network. And there are plans afoot to expand the line to Marrakesh and Fez, and eventually to other major cities. If you're into photography, then head to Chef Chouen, considered one of the prettiest and most photogenic places in Morocco. Nicknamed the Blue Pearl for its traditional blue and white painted houses, the city sits at the foothills of the Rif Mountains in the north of the country. And if you're visiting, don't forget your hiking boots for a trip up the surrounding mountains. You'll be rewarded with spectacular views of the city from above and another perfect photo opportunity. Now, something that's highly recommended, not just here in Fez, but all across Morocco, is the traditional mint tea. Especially good after a heavy meal. Served as a sign of hospitality, it's made of fresh peppermint, water, sugar, and green tea, and is said to have healing properties. Stick around, because after the break, there'll be more from Morocco, plus, does that hurt, or is that just like getting yeah, your the, ears pierced? Yeah, it's gonna uh, hurt, but um, it's gonna... Save your life at the same time. Yeah. We meet the man bringing West Africa's turtles back from the brink of extinction. This is Bab Bujlul. It's one of the seven gateways into this walled city, the Medina, 
And my task, my challenge, is to go from here to another gateway, another of the seven gateways, as quickly as possible. Now, you may say, very easy. I think you might be wrong, because there are 9,000 alleyways here, which makes it the biggest medina in the world. Am I allowed to look at Google Maps? No, I'm not. I think that is actually going down a blind alley. I'm not going to do that. Ooh, now we've got some choices to make. No, that way, I think. I saw a sign earlier on which said, no donkeys. This guy has got through somehow. But some people who are actually born within the city walls never leave the city walls during their lifetime. Whoa! That was close. There's a man in more of a hurry than even me. Some of these hats would be perfect. I would, honestly, this is the kind of place I would stop at if I had time, but I have not got time. Thank you so much. This is the square called Sefarin. And as you can hear, this is the original Tin Pan Alley. We have walked from one gate to another through the Medina of Fez. And can I say, it's been an experience. Next up, we join Nick Quick on his culinary quest to find the real taste of Turkey. Kayseri, a city bang in the middle of Turkey, which once upon a time was part of the old spice route. Today, it's mostly known for its neighbour, Cappadocia, the ancient land of fairy chimneys. But for me, the food is what makes the destination. I grew up in the kitchen. My parents ran Chinese restaurants in Scotland, so my childhood was a constant mix of cultures, tastes and flavours. And now I'm on a mission to uncover more authentic dishes and ingredients from around the world. What's lured me here is a delicacy that dates back over a thousand years. A meat called pasturma, which is this dried beef, a specialty only found in this region. And it's still prepared here the old fashioned way. Pasturma is as important to this area as Parma ham is to Italy. And it's Mount Ergius which towers over the city that creates the perfect climate to cure the meat. I can't wait to taste it for the first time. Hello, how are you? Hello, Lovely to meet you. you. I'm Nick, how are you? Taking me behind the scenes is Julia, whose granddad started this factory back in the 50s. And the way they prepare pastorma here is still true to tradition. Vegetarians, you may want to look away. So this is the first stage of the process where they put loads of salt onto the beef. And this is an entire bath of beef. The salt kills the bacteria and then the meat is hung out to dry, not in the refrigerator, but the good old sun. And lastly, chaman, a paste made from a mix of spices, is lathered onto the meat. The precise recipe is closely guarded, but the extra special ingredient here is the human touch. It's a dying art. Amit tells me there are very few chaman masters coming through the ranks. Such a recurring theme across the board in food, when you have a delicacy such as this, it's, there's only a handful of people left that really are perfecting the art of making it. The rest of it's just becoming commercialised. OK, down the hatch. Flavourful and spicy, yet in recent times, pastrum has fallen out of fashion. So I'm taking some to Istanbul, to a chef who wants to change that. I'm at the newly renovated Galata Port, home to some of the city's best restaurants. Chef Umut is taking traditional Turkish classics and reinvigorating them, giving them a bit of a modern upgrade in the form of small tapas. Hi, Chef okay. Umut. Yes. 
Lovely oh, to meet welcome. you. How are you? Welcome. Great to meet you. Thank you so much. This is for you, the pastor man. Well, me. What's on the menu? This is baklava and pasta ma. Wow! Sweet dessert pastry mixed with salty, meaty beef. The beefy baklava crackers will be topped with hummus, mushrooms and more pasta ma. We're also pickling pasta ma and serving it with a fig chutney. I've never had pickled beef before. Watch your fingers. Pasta wow, pasta. look how green it is. Your dishes are so colourful. Reminds me of Roald Dahl's uh, Georgie's Marvellous Medicine. Cheers. 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 Welcome. Hey, great to meet you. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. And the result? Absolutely sensational. Mm. Who knew, by reimagining old ingredients, Umu has created something both fresh and at the same time classic. Finally this week, we're off to West Africa on the trail of one nature lover who's celebrating 30 years of protecting some of the region's most vulnerable wildlife. Some call him the father of the turtles, and his work may have already rescued one species of terrapin from extinction. We sent Emmeline and Singi and Cozy to meet him close to his home in Senegal. About three hours' journey south, away from the traffic and chaos of Senegal's capital, the dust and aridity begins to give way to greenery. Mangroves and, crucially, seagrass starts appearing here along the coastline, and the wildlife becomes more abundant and precious for all number of reasons. Turtles, tortoises and terrapins have been a big part of West African traditions and symbolisms and in some tribes they are revered as being a good luck charm, a good omen, which is why it's so surprising that their numbers have been going down so much. All five species of sea turtles that nest on these beaches are endangered thanks to fishing activities and pollution. But this man's made it his mission to save them. We're going to put a tag and after that we are going to let it go. Oh. Let me remove that little sound for you. Now you can breathe clearly. Why are they tagging? I mean, why is it done? With that, we can track the migratory pattern for the animals. When we know that, uh, we are going to be more accurate in the strategy we need to implement in order to save these species. Because the more you know about the species, the more you are going to be able to save them. It's like I need to hold my breath. Oh, breathe in. Does that hurt or is that just like getting yeah, the, your ears pierced? Yeah, it's gonna uh, hurt, but um, it's gonna... Save your life at the same time. Yeah. Thomas is about to celebrate 30 years of working with turtles in Senegal. His work has brought him awards and recognitions from around the world. He's so, he's so gentle with it. I mean, he's... You can see that these, these turtles actually are his babies. That's quite an impressive sight. I've never seen it, and I'm sure all of these people haven't either. Everyone literally just run down to, to the beach and see this release. Thomas started as a teenager rescuing African spur tortoises, the second biggest species in the world. Since then, his work in northern Senegal has saved the last remaining colony of Adanson's terrapin from collapse. And these days, he's working on a new encyclopedia and planning the continent's biggest turtle research facility on a plot near his home. It's a big project we are going to take several years and a lot of fundraising, a lot of work in order to have a facility who will be uh, like a, a base camp for everyone who wants to get involved in conservation Total conservation in Africa. What would you like your legacy to be? My legacy will be Africa and African who value nature, who want to protect nature, understand nature is part of our identity. And as an African, this is the place where, like uh, as David Attenborough was saying, this is the kingdom of wilderness. Also, kind of uh, uh, amazing animal like turtle and tortoise who emerged from Africa 260 million years ago. Mm. They need to remain in Africa. Africa 
need to be their paradise. On the outskirts of Dakar, in the backyard of his dad's old farm, Thomas has built this village of the tortoises. It's popular with tourists and school groups, but it's also a hospital for sick and injured turtles. You see the remain of the place where they dig, uh, uh, they, they, they draw a hole in order to put um, a rope to attach the turtle. Wait, yeah, why, why was a rope attached to the turtle? Uh, yeah, because when you have them in captivity and you don't want them to dig in the middle of your lawn, Oh no! Uh, you want to have it like a, a rope in order to control the animals. But now Thomas is taking me to see the head honcho here. This is Bill. So does Bill know you? No. Would you say that he sort of... He... Usually tur turtles are not like dogs. They don't celebrate you like my dog celebrate me okay. when I come back at home. But at the same and that time, is yeah. frustrating because I spend more time and more energy saving them than my dog. <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> that is the reality. He's between 70 and 80 years old, and he and Thomas go way back. So you saw Bill in the zoo when you were a teenager? Teenager, yeah. Wow, OK. Because I spent a lot of time going to the Dakar Zoo. In fact, that was my favorite place to go. Why is he called Bill? Can I ask? Because he arrived the months where Bill Clinton was elected. So you are named after a president. <laughs> I hope you feel the weight of your name. Yeah. You don't hear much about terrapins and tortoises, but Thomas has dedicated his life trying to correct that and make sure that they don't go extinct. And you know what? I've got a feeling that he just might win. What a truly remarkable man doing such important work there in Senegal. Right, well, that's it for this time. But join us next week, if you can, when... With the rising cost of living high on the agenda for many of us when planning our holidays, we'll be finding out if you can travel like our team and still have leftover change in your pocket. From going on safari in Kenya to America's bucket list destinations. So this is Old Faithful, probably one of the world's most famous geezers. That's next week. In the meantime, why not check out a whole host of travel-related content on the BBC by following the links on your screen right now. In the meantime, from me, Rajan Datar, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Morocco, thanks for watching and goodbye.